Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul winding down this particular letter to the church at Ephesus. and He begins in chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren... He said, now I'm going to end all this. I'm bringing it to conclusion. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood and against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, st- to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Take a stand. Fathers, we come in your presence. We just want to tell you that we love you. Thank you for the opportunity. We have to lift our voices in praise unto you and Father, to give back a portion of what you've entrusted us with. And Father, as we come now to the breaking of the bread of life as the Holy Spirit ministers unto us the very things of Christ this morning, may you be glorified by all that is said and done. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I got to thinking about the day and time which we're living, and it is a very unique time. Uh, I guess, in history. It's not so much unlike a lot of other periods of history, but it is unique in the retrospect that we're now seeing prophecy being fulfilled all around us. We come to the place to where The rulers of the darkness of this world is getting bolder and bolder as the days go on. And spiritual wickedness in high places is getting more open than it ever has been before. In fact, it has taken on, if I can say it this way, uh, an in-your-face type of attitude. The wickedness in high places that just stood up and said, we're going to do what we want to do. And as for the children of God, we don't care what you say. And yet God told us that in these particular days, God has provided us everything we need to stand in these evil times. But it amazed me with all that God has given us as far as the armor of God is concerned. He did not, he told us what we need to put on. But can I tell you, he also wants us to, how can I say this? Be skilled in what we have put on as far as the armor of God goes. And you can't be skilled in using something until you have practiced with it. When when young David was going to go fight Goliath, uh, Saul called him into his presence and, and gave him his armor. And David put it on and looked at it and said, I don't know how to use this. I, he'd never been into battle. He'd never fought, went in and fought against a giant. He'd killed a lion. He'd killed a bear. But he had not uh, killed. I uh, went into battle with uh, the armor that uh, soldiers wore. And he said, I have not tried these things. And he picked up his sling and five smooth stones out of the riverbed and went into the battle with what he had tested and proven that he could use. And so God has given us everything we need to stand, but there needs to be some testing and some proving before we can really stand. 
Too many times God's people put on the armor of God and when the battle comes, they turn tail and run and they are defeated. You see, God never provided any armor in the back and he didn't tell us not to turn our back. He just assumed that as the children of God, we would take up the mantle, take up the spirit of God, take up the word of God and charge with all of our heart into the battle. Sometimes, sometimes we just need to make some conscious decisions before we have to make some conscious decisions. Now, for this morning, I'm going to give you just a few examples of people who had prepared their life for the battle that they was fixing to face without ever knowing what the battle really was. And the first thing that came to my mind was the three Hebrew children. Uh, as they was taken into captivity there in Babylon, they, uh, they had nothing if you could say this, it was not necessarily because of their sin, but rather the sin of the nation of Israel had gotten so bad that God allowed them to be taken into captivity, taken into bondage. And when they were taken into bondage, Nebuchadnezzar went and he took, uh, took of the uh, princes and the, uh, the royal blood and all this and brought them into the country, uh, made them eunuchs and began to teach them what they needed to do and how they needed to survive in the kingdom of Babylon as wise men. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel decided and from the onset that they would not defile themselves with the things of the king. They would not defile themselves with the things of this world and they had no idea what that was going to allow them to do in the future, but had you not taken that stand, they'd never been able to go through the fire. Now, I guarantee you that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea that one day, as time progressed, that Nebuchadnezzar would get plumb crazy and try to make himself out to be a god. We got a lot of politicians today doing that same thing. <laughs> Woo! So we're going to govern. And we're smarter than you are, so we're going to tell you how, to, how you're supposed to live. And most of them wouldn't know spirituality in God if they walked up and sat down next to him. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had some, some practicing to do before they got into the battle. They had to learn how to depend completely upon God. They had to learn how to make that conscious decision that says no matter where the world goes, how the world is reacting, we're going to stand for God no matter what. Because they had made that conscious decision, when the time came and Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down when you hear the music, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no thank you. And the king got all upset. I mean, after all, it was his command. After all, everybody's supposed to obey the command of the king. Can I tell you, we're supposed to obey the laws of our land. But when the laws of our land goes against, go against this book, we need to have a conscious decision to stand for the book. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had tested uh, their faith. God had brought them to the place that they could re realize completely and wholly upon God. I, and when Nebuchadnezzar said, I tell you what, I'll give you a second chance. <laughs> and they said, you know what, old king? You give us all the chances you want. Now I'm paraphrasing. But it don't make any difference how many chances you get us. We're not going to bow down to an idol. I, and, and be it known unto the old king, you might kill us. Our God can deliver us if he chooses to, but whether he chooses to or not to, be it known unto thee, old king, we're not bowing our knee to you because you're not God. Too many of God's people have bowed their knee to the things of this world and began to bring them into their, their life 
as gods. And, and because they had come to that conscious decision that they would not defile themselves with the things of this world, when God stood up for them, they stood up for God. I, I, there's a song out, and I love it. I can't remember who sings it. But talking about uh, the young man, his mama was telling the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. <laughs> and he said, Mama, I only got one question for you. If three went in and four walked around, three came out, where'd that fourth man go? And the song says, and Mama said as she danced across the floor, <laughs> he's still in the fire. Amen. I mean, God's still in the fire waiting on you and I to get through the fire, but we can never go through that fire with God in the midst of it until we have made a conscious decision. We will not defile ourselves with the things of this world. Then I got thinking about the fourth man in that scenario, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I got thinking about Daniel. Daniel <laughs> had to make a conscious decision to worship God no matter what. See, a lot of times, a lot of times we let circumstances get us out of the place of worshiping Almighty God. Sometimes we get circumstances that will allow us to use an excuse not to be in God's house. About 4.30 this morning, I'm sitting in my chair and Miss Webster said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. She said, what's wrong? I said, I don't feel good. And she said, well, where, where don't you feel good? I said, all over. I said, I, I'm not really sick, sick. I just don't feel well. And she said, are you going to make it this morning? And I bolstered myself up and I said, I'm going to be in church today. 4.30, I called Mark. The phone rang, phone rang, phone rang. Nobody answered. I thought, well, 4.30, he's probably in the shower. So I waited until 5 o'clock, and I called Mark again. to listen to me. I had already purposed in my heart. I felt so bad I wasn't coming today. And I called him the second time. The phone rang, and the phone rang, and the phone rang, and the phone rang. And I said, okay, Lord, you don't have to hit me with a brick. Mark's not, Mark hadn't answered, and I'm not going to wait till he gets to church at 7 o'clock this morning for staff meeting and tell him, oh, by the way, you're preaching. I said, I'll go ahead and get up, and I'll make a conscious decision that I'm going to go worship no matter how bad I feel. And God said, it's about time, preacher. <laughs> Isn't it great when God talks to you sometimes like that? So I got up, got dressed, and come to church because I made a conscious decision that I was going to worship God today with you no matter what. Always said, and this got nothing to do with the message. Always said that when I when I pass, I would love to pass standing behind the pulpit preaching. And then I thought, you talk about something that would just kill a whole service. That'd be it. I want to tell you. <laughs> Mark gets up and says, "Well, he's dead. Y'all move him in the back. And let's go on." Everybody's gonna go. Is he really dead? I said, no, he just fell off the pulpit on his head for it because for, he thought it looked good. Now, listen to me. I, I, then I changed my mind. I said, God, I don't want to die like that because it's going to mess up a worship service. And the most important thing that we can do is worship you no matter what. 
So God, when, I, when you get ready to take me, if I'm preaching, let me finish preaching and finish the invitation and get home and scare my wife. <laughs> let her deal with me dying. And somebody says, well, what would she do? She'd probably look at me and go, I told you you needed to make it look like an accident. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But we need, to, we need to literally make a conscious decision that we're going to serve God, we're going to worship God no matter what. Daniel made that conscious decision and it started just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It started with a conscious decision not to get involved and wrapped up in the things of this world. Isn't it amazing that both these individuals, both groups, had the same foundation? God tells his children today, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. <laughs> Paul, Paul writing to one of the churches said, don't entangle yourself again with the world if God's called you into the battle. Now, I paraphrase that. Otherwise, when God calls us to be soldiers of the king, we're not to involve ourselves in the cares of this world or the things of this world again that would stop us from serving our king in the battle. So Daniel made that decision. And time after time after time, Daniel's faith in that decision was tested and tested and tested until one day the king made a decree. Nobody could ask or give a petition to anybody or God other than the king. And if they did, they would be cast into a den of lions. And Daniel, knowing the king had signed that proclamation and what the king said was set and nobody could change it, not even him. And Daniel, three times a day, as he had done in the past, opened his windows toward the holy city and poured his heart out to God in prayer and praise. <laughs> and the enemy came along and said, Well, look at here, king. You made the decree, and here's your favorite uh, in the kingdom, and disobeying your, your law and disobeying what you said. Put him to death. Put him in the lion's den. And Daniel was praying that day and they opened the door and uh, they, they came in and they put him uh, in chains and they carried him off and they put him down in the lion's den. Daniel's uh, kicking and screaming, God, no, I'll change my mind. I won't do this. I'll not pray again. I'll never do it. God didn't admit to me. David didn't do any of that. Right. They took him to the lion's den and Daniel says, wait a minute, boys. You open it up, I'll crawl in. He trusted God that much. They put him down the lion's den. Those big old lions became giant kitty cats. <laughs> and the king lamented all night and <laughs> walked the floor. Got up the next morning, went by that den of lions, said, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And Daniel says, don't worry, king. Don't worry, old king. <laughs> Live forever. My God's still on the throne. And I'm still all in one piece. And the, they go on and read the rest of the story. And those that made the accusation against Daniel was thrown in that same den of lions. And the Bible says that, that they broke their bones and began to eat on them before they ever hit the bottom. Whew. And it all started with a conscious decision. But I got to thinking about somebody else. I got to thinking about, I got to thinking about Gideon. Gideon hiding behind the wine press, willowing wheat to hide it from the enemy. And the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and he said, Oh, thou mighty man of valor. And I can almost see Gideon now looking around and go, Huh? Who are you talking to? <laughs> he said, uh, 
They, I, I want to show you some things like you never thought you'd ever see before. And Gideon says, oh yeah, where's all the miracles I've heard about? And the angel of the Lord says, come out from your hiding place and I'll show you some. You just get up, almighty man of valor, and get back into the battle and I'll show you some miracles like you never could imagine would ever happen. So Gideon got up, <laughs> took a yoke of his father's oxen, tore down the altar to Baal, burnt the plow, killed the oxen, and destroyed their worship service. And they got all upset. Can I tell you something? When God's people get really serious about serving God, the world's going to get upset. And they're going to try everything they can to put us uh, to shame, to stop us from doing what we know God would have us to do. You can't have an assembly to worship. You can go play golf. You can go to the supermarket. You can go to this place and that place and, and something else, but you can't go worship God because of this coronavirus virus that we've got going around. And because of that, just shut down the house of God and let the people of God watch on TV. And I tell you, that's part of our problem already. We've let the TV do too much for us. We let it babysit our kids, and our kids grew up desensitized to violence. They grew up with no respect for the parents. They grew, they grew up thinking daddy's an idiot. Come on, that's what they portray the men, uh, any man on TV is an idiot. He's less smart than the women, and the women are less smart than the children. And the children are in charge of everything. <laughs> a guy had a rebellious daughter. She was about 14, 15 years old. He was going to correct her. She bowed her little self up in her daddy's face. And I'm telling you this is a story that actually happened where we was at at the time. She bowed up in, his, in her daddy's face and said, if you touch me, I'll call Child Protective Services and they'll put you in jail. And he said, really? She said, try me. He picked up his phone and he dialed 911. This is so-and-so. I live at so-and-so address and I'm fixing to give my daughter a spanking. And she told me she's fixing to call you. Might as well send somebody because it's fixing to happen. Hung the phone up and tanned her hide. About 10 minutes after they got through with the, the, the spanking and the crying and the wailing and the weeping and all that went on in that house that day, there was a knock on the door. The guy went to the door and there stood, stood there an officer of the law and he looked at him with his hand on his gun. And he said, are you so-and-so? And the guy said, yes, sir, I am. He said, did you whip that girl? He said, yes, sir, I did. He said, good man. And left. But we've let TV teach our kids not to have any respect for authority. <laughs> you don't have to bow your knee to anybody. Let me tell you something. Cop open, pulls a gun on me and says, get on your knees. I'm not on get on my, I get all the way down on my face. Amen. Somebody says, well, I, I just wouldn't do that. Well, can I tell you something? I, I will fight it out in the court of law afterwards, but I'd just soon be alive to do it. And then they wonder why it is that so many people are getting shot. Because we have come to the place that we have no, are you ready for this? No sense of responsibility to submit to authority and police officers are taught to make you submit to their order had a, had a, this got nothing to do with the message I'm just going to throw it in for you people out there in TV land my grandson now working close to 30 and I was sitting and talking one day and he said I just don't understand 
why it is. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. You're in your car and you get pulled over. And this, this police officer, highway patrolman, whoever he happens to be, walks up to the side of your car and says, sir, would you please step out of the vehicle? And you tell him, no. He said, sir, now he's not asking, now he's telling. He said, sir, I said, step out of the vehicle. And you say, no. And now he's screaming at you. Step out of the vehicle, step out of the vehicle. And he don't know what you're fixing to do, so he backs up two steps, puts his hand on his gun, and said, I said, get out of the vehicle. And you say, no. What do you expect him to do? And my grandson looked at me, and I, he said, call back up. And I said, okay. So he calls back up. Now you've got 12 officers out there. And all of them around your car with their hands on their gun, some of them with their guns drawn, yelling and screaming at you, get out of the vehicle. Get your hands up. And you go, no. Do you expect they're just going to let you drive off? He looked at me and I said, listen to me. Police officers are trained to bring the situation under full control by subduing the individual who is resisting the authority that is there. I said, the first thing that officer's going to do is drag you out of that car. And depending on how much you kick, scream, and fight, is going to be how much he's going to kick, scream, and fight on top of your head. Well, I think, I said, that's your problem, son. You're not thinking that we're to submit ourselves to the authority over us. You say, well, there's some bad cops out there. Yeah, there's some bad cops out there. You get out of the car, and he slaps you around a little bit. He puts handcuffs on you and takes you off to jail. And on the way to jail, he slaps you around a little bit more. And when you get to jail, your eyes are swollen shut, your lips are bleeding, and, and you're a total may, a messed up mess. And when you get there, <laughs> that officer says, sit down. And you go, nope. <laughs> what do you expect he's going to do? Turn you loose? He said, no, he's going to make you look worse than you did. Now, the problem with all this is, bad cops, yes, submit, fight it out in the courts when you're over with. And the side of the highway is not to determine that you've got more rights than that cop's got. That cop's got a job to do. Gideon's hiding behind the wine press, and God says, you know what? If you stop hiding and start acting like a man, I'll show you some things you never thought possible. That's part of the problem we're having today as Christians. Come on, we're hiding. We're behind the wine press, willowing our wheat, hoping nobody sees that we're serving God. <laughs> oh, mighty man of valor. He got up, he faced a battle. First of all, to make a conscious decision that he was not going to hide anymore. And then he made a conscious decision that he was going to remove the idols from his life. And then he made a conscious decision that he was going to follow God into the battle no matter what. Even when God took the army that he had gathered and whittled it all the way down to 300, he was going to follow God. And then God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put a trumpet in one hand and a lamp under a, a, a jar in the other hand. Now, wait a minute, God. What am I going to hold the spear with? How about my sword, Lord? I mean, I got both hands full. <laughs> what, do you, what do you expect me to do? <laughs> Throw the fire at them and beat them with the trumpet? What do you want me to God says, listen, it's not your battle, it's mine. I think God's people need to understand this is not our battle. 
It's God's battle. And he's given us the instruments by which he wants us to fight it. So Gideon says, well, okay, Lord, if you're sure, but just in case you're not, let's, let's do a little test here. Let's put the fleece out. God answered the fleece. He said, okay. But just to make sure again, Lord, he put the fleece out a second time. And Gideon says, well, okay. God knew that his heart was still a little quivery. So he said, I tell you what you do this time. Go down and listen to what they're saying. I, I think we ought to start listening to what the wicked are saying about God's house. See, there's a lot of God's house that the wicked are saying, whoo, you ought to go over there. They have a time in that place. Man, they sing and they, they holler and they hold their hands up and they jump around. And listen to me, there's, not, there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of that. But when it's all show and no go, that's all wrong. When a person can stand up and says, praise ye the Lord, and go out and live like the devil, there's something wrong with that. When a man stands up and says, I love, I, I love the Lord. I, blessed be the name of the Lord. And don't tithe and don't give. And never does anything for God. There's something wrong with that. That's just putting cowardness across the face of a conscious decision to stop hiding. We've let the world ruin us in a lot of ways. Let me move on. Get over to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, Saul at that time, on his way to Damascus to imprison and or kill Christians. He had a, we used to call them hometown wives, come to Jesus meeting on the road to Damascus. He's on his way and bright light shone around him and blinded him. He's on the ground, the voice of God talking to him. And he said, Saul, Saul. And Saul said, yea, Lord. He said, tough to kick against the pricks. Otherwise, all you're doing is hurt yourself. And I know God didn't say this, but I just want to throw it in. All you're doing is hurt yourself, dummy. Stop kicking against the pricks, Saul. Well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Get up, go into Damascus, and a, plate, a street called Straight, sit down and wait. Now, God's telling Saul, sit down and wait. Now, Saul's not used to waiting. Saul's used to going. Saul's used to getting things done. Saul's one of these guys that says, you know what, let's go bear hunting with a switch and we'll give the bear the switch. Amen. Well, there's, not too, there's nothing too much for us. If we'll just get go, let me tell you something. <laughs> Zeal without godly preparation. I'm going to apologize before I say it, dear. But zeal without godly preparation is stupid. It's dangerous. And more of God's people have been ruined by zeal without godly preparation than those who take a moment and get prepared and get into the battle God's way. God's way. Paul had wait, the opportunity to go down to the street and you wait. I'll send somebody to talk to you. <laughs> so he's on the streets called straight. And God talked to Ananias, and he said, Ananias, there's a man named Saul waiting on the street to talk to you. And Ananias says, I've heard of him. Well, go talk to him. And Ananias says, isn't he the one that turned the church up? Yeah, but you need to go talk to him. But isn't he the one that's imprisoning Christians? Yeah, but you need to go talk to him. Lord, isn't he the one that's killed some people? Yeah, but you need to go talk to him. He's waiting on you. Can I tell you something? Y'all ready for this? Ananias had a conscious decision to obey God too. 
And he could have made every excuse in the world and we would not have had one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived. Dedicated and sold out to God because it all started with the conscious decision that I'm going to be obedient. You got to make a conscious decision not to defile yourself with the things of the world. You got to make a conscious decision that you're going to worship, true worship, no matter what. And a conscious decision to stop hiding who you are. And a conscious decision to be obedient unto God. All that starts with a conscious decision. And once you make that decision, God says, now, you're ready. Now put on that armor. Now get into the battle. What decision are you going to make today? It's your time. Your decision. Everything we do now is preparing us for the fire to come. Everything we do now is preparing us for that den of lions. Everything we do now is preparing us for the battle. Everything we do now is preparing us to be obedient even if it sounds like we can't do it. But what decision will you make today? It all starts with a conscious decision. Stand with me, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed.